Am I okay? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why so many sad faces after worship? <laughs> no, just kidding. How many of you are really, really excited in the presence of the living God? Amen. I always get excited when I get into the presence of God, whether it's in church or whether, whether it's at home. doesn't matter because we are getting into the presence of God, who is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. When He chooses to stay with us, come and be with us, to speak to us, it matters a lot to me. Uh, I know that you will also agree to that. Because when the King of Kings come and speak to you, I want to spend time with you, it makes a huge difference rather than being somewhere else, isn't it? So you long to be in His presence, you long to be there where God wants you to be, amen? Or where God is always there to speak to you. And today we're going to speak um, or I'm gonna, we're going to meditate uh, on certain things. Uh, I know today um, is a, a Pentecost Sunday where um, we talk about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But I want, I'm going to take you through certain things. One of the important feasts about what Jesus speaks to people and how he proclaims that the Holy Spirit has to be given to people. And in what manner of God this Holy Spirit was given and how this Holy Spirit is flowing in us and through us how can it operate through us because um, as Abraham was saying we receive it but it's something hard that we are not given to people we receive and we have it all of us have received the Holy Spirit but it matters that are we giving that or is it flowing out from us amen so that's what we're gonna see today just tell you just close our eyes for a moment and then Look into the word of God. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes wherever you are. I just want you to do only one thing before we start. Getting into this word of God. Pray in your heart. God, I want to receive your word today. Many times we sit in the church and sometimes we don't receive the word. We are there, but we don't receive it. I pray today that God will minister to us. That you will set your heart this evening time. That you will receive the word of God today. Amen. Just pray in your heart for, a, for just 10 seconds. Just few words. Say, God, I want to receive today. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit, oh Father. Lord, you're already in midst of us, oh Lord Jesus. Lord, when you come down, you change things upside down, Lord Father. And Lord, this evening time, we wait on you. Because we know that you are going to speak to us. Mm. We know that you are here in midst of us to do something extraordinary, Lord. Supernatural things will happen Amen. when you come down, Lord, Father God. And this evening time, thank you for bringing this bunch of people that we're going to listen together. Mm. We're going to hear together. And we're going to be blessed together, Lord, Father God. We summon this entire time in the mighty hand that you will speak and minister. Mm. Your precious soul. And shall we say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn with me to John chapter 7. And I'm going to read a few verses. We're going to read through a lot of verses today. And uh, as I uh, even said last time when I was preaching, the more we read, the more we know. Yes? Amen. Say with me, the more we read, the more, the we, more we know. The more we know. Shall we say? The more we, the more read, we read, the more we know. Amen. Hallelujah. So, John chapter 7, verses, uh, just three verses. Verses from 37 to 39. <coughs> On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. He didn't just say, he cried out means, he was literally crying out with this voice saying, mm. he cried out what he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Mm. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, hold up his heart, the flow of rivers of living water. water. 39 words just give the gist of what Jesus was trying to say. It says, but this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. It's very interesting to know. This is a very, very, um, um, very interesting passage actually. It's just three verses in the Bible but we're going to go through a lot a lot of lot of things today to know at what context and what circumstance Jesus has spoken this and how it can be applied to our life today so that we can not be Christians who believe and have received it 
but we'll be Christians who have received and are flowing in the living water out of us. Amen? Amen. It's very important. Um, I still remember um, um, when I was, uh, I usually used to say my, um, that I used to remember uh, the way uh, God anointed me because um, uh, when I read always this verse, always remember how the word of God comes through in our lives. Because um, I, I just so uh, uh, went into Karunia uh, to do my engineering. It was just my first year, just few days. Um, father, mother doing God's ministry, good. But still, I didn't have a personal relationship with God. I didn't know. Reading Bible and praying every day is a fact. It's a, it's a must for me because um, I've been brought up. But the personal relationship with God, I've been going through meetings, a number of meetings. My father used to preach, so I have to go whenever he preaches. So many meetings happen in Chennai. You go there, you sit there, you still receive something, but nothing changed in you. So here I go, I go to college um, in the first year, and there comes a great holiday called Puja Holidays. So five days of holidays. So those who really, really have come afar from home, they will love to go back home just in a month's time, I believe, a month time, this puja on this came, I think, uh, end of August. <clears throat> so everybody in the first year booked the uh, tickets going back home. So I called my dad because I don't have money, so I just told dad, can you just book a ticket for me? The dad said, I heard some, some meeting is going to happen in Karunia for the students especially. Why don't you stay? Don't come. It's gone. How bad it would be when father says, don't come home. <laughs> So it's like, <clears throat> so I, I remember it was just 15 of us, 15 um, youngsters from our first year hostel. Uh, we stayed back and rest of all the thousands of our, our classmates, our colleagues, uh, our, our students have gone back happily to home and enjoy with the family for five days, a week, seven days. So they'll come back healthy, <laughs> eating a lot of mom's food. Um, but this happened because God planned it so. I um, went for the first day and um, the message was going on and uh, I've been mean, quite hearing a lot of messages but nothing has happened like this on the day when I heard this message. Something broke in my heart and felt, oh, being a Christian, have I didn't realize this love of God all these days? Or have I didn't long for this anointing of God which is more important for me rather than anything in my life? With so much of ambitions, we come out of the homes to go and study, but God made a, major, made a difference in my life. So I was sitting there, this afternoon, uh, sorry, this morning message touched my heart. I stood before everybody and I, uh, I raised my hand and said, God, I'm coming to my life. That was a great moment. The afternoon they said, we're going to have an anointing time and uh, uh, so go to your hostels, have a good food, come back, prepare for all your morning session. So I was more excited about this session because I was feeling very thirst deep inside that I need to receive this anointing. Somewhere else, I don't know how it got hold in my heart, but I was thinking, I need to receive this anointing in me. And this thirst was, you know, the funny thing is like, just because I had so much to receive this, I thought, I've seen people, um, they're shaking like anything when they receive anointing, they've been um, probably falling down. So I thought probably we need to prepare so much eating. So there was nice chicken curry and rice in the hostel. So I uh, ate a lot. I went for a second round and then I thought, oh, I'm going to get this anointing. So I'm going to, the thirst was so much. What I'm trying to say is the thirst was so much. So much of thirst was there. So I came and I, it was um, a room where, a room like this. Uh, uh, I think uh, it was one of the uh, engineering rooms, uh, practical rooms. So um, we were all sitting down. So bunch of, you can see thousands of children, like students were sitting uh, and the, the uh, preacher, uh, he, didn't, he didn't want to preach, he was just standing there and saying the same verse, if you thirst today, you will receive. No, my excitement, my thirst was so much, so I was sitting in the very, very front row because I know I don't want to miss that. I want to receive as soon as it comes out of someone. I haven't read the verse saying that. I've never known much of scriptures that time. I didn't realize that the rivers of water will flow like that and touch someone. I didn't know that. I was just sitting there. And the preacher said, just kneel down wherever you are. He was so polite. He was very calm. He didn't like, ah, no, come on. He didn't do anything like that. He was just, he just stood up and said, 
the anointing of God will come upon you. The moment he said that word, you know, from here, I flew to the middle of the crowd. You will not realize how I flew, but I just went like that because the power when it comes, with the thirst you have, God wants to fill you more and more, the more you thirst. So I went in, the, uh, the other side of it is like, because I ate so much, I wanted so much. Because I was shaking so much, I couldn't contain what I ate. And because the person who was standing in front who knows my father and he knows that, okay, I'm son of so-and-so, he said, oh, give me some water, give me some water, let him not faint. What I'm trying to say to you, when you thirst, the more you thirst, the more you receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not the thirst you have for one day and then you leave it. Mm. You can't say, I can drink water today off only for this afternoon when I take a meal and I can't take water. I don't want to take water anymore. No! You thirst physically. The spiritual man inside you needs to have the thirst to receive the anointing every day. The thirst. Many times what happens is in a Christian life, we go, we stand, we believe, we receive, but we don't realize sometimes, one side of us, we don't realize that we have received the anointing. And many people still keep asking, oh, I need this anointing, I need the anointing. But you know, when you start to believe, as the word says, you want to receive. The second part crowd is, as soon as they receive, they are so happy, they're excited, they build a good big dam around them, they start with a good water, and they say, I'm blessed, I've received, I'm contained, but nothing flowing on of them. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the verse. On the last day, that the great day of the feast. So what was the feast? Uh, in um, uh, in the traditions, in the, in the uh, Israel traditions, they have around seven feasts. Um, we'll go through it, and I'm not going to go through all the seven because I'm just picking up the one feast which Jesus was trying to say here. If you go to a little bit down, or before uh, chapter 7, uh, the beginning of chapter 7, you'll see um, chapter 7 verse 2, uh, or I read from verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Mm. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So what was the feast? Feast of tabernacles. The feast of tabernacles. So, the last day of the feast, Jesus is standing and crying out. So we'll come back to that later. So, what is, so just because um, I want you all to know what is this feast. I'm not, I'm just getting familiar with this all and I thought probably I'll also say to you guys because uh, you'll understand. You need to understand because many of us don't uh, meditate on this feast and don't, uh, sometimes leave it because it's Old Testament, Old Old Testament. We are more excited about New Testament, but there are more resemblance how God fulfills whatever He asked people to do in the Old Testament through Jesus. Amen. Amen. So uh, there are a lot of uh, verses in Bible. If you can um, you can read, read all the um, about the seven feasts in Leviticus chapter twenty three verses from thirty four to you can go home and read it. But I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all the verses because it's going to be very huge. We're going to read few, but not everything. And you can also read uh, in Numbers chapter 29 verses from 12 to 39 which says every single day while they, the feast is around for 15 days. It takes for 15 days and the first part of the feast is for 8 days. So they say each day God has told Moses every single day what you guys have to do. You have to go here, you have to cut this, uh, uh, give this uh, drink offering, you have to give the burnt offering, you have to give the fire offering, you have to do everything. So this goes on. But the important fact I want to give to you uh, today, I want to um, meditate is about, if you go back to Leviticus chapter 23, a few things. How this Feast of Tabernacles uh, is more relevant for us and in what context Jesus speaks on the, why should Jesus speak on the last day, right? So it's uh, interesting to know that um, how Jesus has fulfilled and our anointing of the living water flow in our lives today. Amen? Are you with me? Amen. Yes? Yes. So go back to Leviticus chapter 23 and um, let's read from verse 33. I'm going to read quite a lot of verses, so stay with me. If you have your Bibles or if you have a gadgets, please open. It's good to see the word and uh, read through the word. It'll be good for you to understand. Amen? 
Leviticus chapter 23 verses from 33. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel saying, The fifteenth day of this, this seventh month, so this feast happens very uh, in the Israel or in the uh, Jewish calendar around October, September, the seventh month of the year. Um, of tabernacle, month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no custom, customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly and you shall do no customary work on it. So you shouldn't work, do anything, you should just do what? Go, do offering, worship, worship, worship. How would it be? Your good is in there. Today in this world of uh, fast moving internet and ITs, I just wonder if I go and take an off for 15 days and I tell to my manager that I'm going to do Feast of Tabernacle, <laughs> no one will let me to do, isn't it? It would be, it'd be very hard to think about, but God commanded, you know, the uh, Jewish people still do it because of one, of the, uh, one of the important feasts for them is the Passover, the Pentecost and the Tabernacle. So Tabernacle, Feast of Tabernacle is one of the very, very important um, uh, feasts for them and they celebrate till today. So um, let's move on with the verses. So um, 37, there are, these are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocation to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day. Besides the Sabbath of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your oaths, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the Lord, then you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. Amen. So Amen. verse 40. And you shall take for yourself on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So for the first day, seven days, what happened? What they do is um, they take the uh, palm leaves, they take uh, uh, all the branches of the trees, and they start to build a tent. You guys there? Yeah. What they do? They build up. Oh, are you hearing? They build up. Okay. Yeah, they build a tent. You know, oh, there are certain significance why they build this tent. Uh, I've read a lot of articles. I was meditating so much on this, and I was trying to understand why they want to build uh, a tent with leaves. They can. I got. They, when God asked Noah to build a heart, He specifically tell, told them, told him the specifications about take this wood, this kind of wood, this kind of structure. It was totally different. When they want to do a build a simple tent, God didn't allow them to build a tent with bricks. He wanted them to build with leaves. So the significance is, when they build this tent with leaves, they have small, small holes. Small, small holes in it. So what happens is, every day, for the seven days, they will sit inside this tent. And inside this tent, the night, they will lie down and see, because of the small holes, they will see the stars. And they will remember, oh, for 40 years, God has led all my fathers to the wilderness. It's a remembrance. The face is for the remembrance of what God has done to them in the wilderness. So they lie down and they go and see the stars. Oh, my father, my mother, oh, they've done so, they've gone through so much, and God has led them. And, oh, and also, with all the small holes, there will be some breeze coming in. And some kind of insects also fly because so they remember how God protected them in midst of all the things happened in the wilderness. But you know something? Inside the tent, the reason why God wanted them to build is because God wants to come and stay with them inside the tent so they can have a time with God. They can have a rest time with God when they stay in the tent. I was um, I don't know how many of you watched this uh, program. Um, in one of the gospel channels, it's called uh, it's supernatural. 
I love this program because I love to be supernatural. Because I long to have supernatural miracles always happen through us and to us. So the first time that I got to know about this program, I used to at least watch it sometime, record and see them because of the first things we have. On, on one program, there was an interview going with this uh, fine man uh, who was doing his ministry. And what happened is, like this person said, one day God spoke to him and said, I want to, you to build a tent in your home. So this person thought, oh God, I can't build with the leaves now. Uh, if I go and build this in my backyard, it's going to be too bad. People will think that I'm a man. So he decided, um, uh, because at home also like our kids, they have this bunk bed or something like that, which they can zip in and go inside and stay. So he took a small uh, bed like that and then he built a small zipping stuff. So he went inside that. But you know something, I was shocked. Because when God asks you to do something, it has more relevance to do because he doesn't say just because he wants to say. He say because he knows that he's going to do something special with you. Amen. So this person went inside this tent and he couldn't come out of the tent because he didn't know where he was. As soon as he went inside this tent, the anointing of God filled him. He forgot about where he was. The next moment he was in heaven. Amen. And he had the experience to see the heaven, the glorious God. I was shocked. When God asked you to set apart some time to stay with him inside his tent, many of us know, as I said, it's very, very busy times. We can't even think about having this kind of feast of tabernacle in this current day in London, the time where you stay. I can't go and help, but we can still build some tents at home. When I say tent, build a time for God. Build a time for God so He can speak to you. It's very important these days because many times we want to have some time with God, but we don't set the right time with God. We always say we want to pray, we want to pray, but we don't pray at all. Morning, I want to pray. Afternoon, I want to pray. Evening, I want to pray. But at the end of the day, no prayer. So then, you can pray. The Feast of Tabernacles. God insisted. He knows the people of Israel. They can easily forget things. They can easily turn back and say, God, you didn't do anything to me. That's why he made a commandment, covenant with them saying, build a tent so that I can come inside and speak to you. So it's very important. So moving ahead. And one more, uh, one more uh, thing which they um, very often do, this feast of, feast of tabernacle is, uh, uh, they, the priest take huge jars um, and they go to the pool of Siloam. At the Siloam, the big pool, they go and draw this water. I don't know, I think six, seven jars, I don't know how many jars they do. But they do it for the whole seven days. They take the water from the Shalom and they come to the altar and throw this water. I'll come back to that because that's going to be very important about why Jesus at the last day was saying this beautiful verse and cried out saying, All who thirst, come to me because from you will flow the rivers of living water. The water makes very important resemblance in our life because the word of God is self told in verse 39. This he was talking about the, the spirit. spirit of God. You know something? When we receive or when we accept Jesus, we automatically receive this Holy Spirit inside of us. And I want to touch two important things, the factors of water, which is the character of Jesus himself through the Holy Spirit, which we should operate every day in our life. And these two characters, if it can flow from us, then it can touch so many people around us. Amen? So, one of the important factors I'm going to talk about is this river as the water of life. This river as the water of life. For in 
Revelation chapter 21. It talks more about chapter 1, chapter 22 verse 1. It talks more about the river of the water of life that's in heaven, which has been there for the 12 months to set apart the healing, the living life, the everlasting life has been flowing out of the river. No, what happens when the river flows? It keeps flowing. It doesn't matter what is before it. It just keeps flowing and flowing. And wherever it flows, as we were saying, the river is here. Wherever it flows, it gives refreshing in life. Amen? So, let's read, uh, let's read a little about this um, everlasting life, the, the river of life. Let's move to Ezekiel um, chapter 47, I believe. I think. Let's move to Ezekiel. Turn your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 47. Let me read my notes as well. <laughs> Yes. Right. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, this is one of um, Ezekiel's vision, and he sees this, and um, um, he, he talks more about how describes um, how this the healing waters, the river of everlasting water flow. Because these are two characters I'm going to talk very, very specifically today about the river of life. And the river of healing and this river has to flow from us okay so this is very important so please concentrate please understand and um, so that you'll be able to understand how important is it to operate with the gifts of God when this river of God or, or the river of God is flowing from us amen, amen. so what happens is um, as you know um, in the Old Testament when the Israelites people were coming to the desert they came, they were so happy, um, they was, and suddenly they were very hungry. And they thought, oh Moses, what happened? What are you going to eat? We had plenty of food at least, though we were tormented. We had something to eat in Egypt. So Moses goes, very nice man, he goes and prays to God, God, these people want some food. So God sends manna, they're fed. They move on. Suddenly they come and say, Oh, where we go for water? And they say, Did you bring us to be killed in this desert without water? If you read uh, uh, Exodus chapter 17, the God says, Moses, take them to that rock and I will bring out the water of life. Jesus is the water of life. Because if you just take few pages before John chapter 7, that is John chapter 4, they come to a point where Jesus explains this to the Samaritan woman very, very clearly about how this water, the living water is very important for her. So if you come to John chapter 4, verse, a um, few verses from verse... Seven, let's read from verse seven. So, you know about the story, right? So I'm not gonna go into the story and say, say I'll tell to you about what happens to the Samaritan woman, how she comes and meets Jesus. So Jesus' disciples have gone to buy some food for Jesus because uh, uh, he was hungry and then uh, he's, he's sitting there in the well. So this woman comes, okay? This woman comes and he says, um, a woman of some, uh, verse seven, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is that you being a Jew asked to drink from me a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The interesting part is, the world will say, you shouldn't deal with someone. But God will say, you deal with them. It's very difficult. Jesus could have just left this Samaritan woman and probably gone. But he knows there's going to be a great, great, great thing going to happen when he's going to have a talk with this person. That's why he comes and sits there. So Jesus says, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is that you being a Jew? So we read it. So verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who is it who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
So who is this living water? And who can give it? Jesus is the living water. And he wants to give this living water to the Samaritan woman. See, it's very, very important. At this time of world, when you come to know a person who's living with five different people, or have lived with four people, four different men, and then now living with someone else, you will automatically have a mindset not to talk to them. You will automatically come to a point, physically, to think, I don't want to have any deal with this person. How bad, how ridiculous it could be. Oh no, never. I'm so holy, I've received God. Oh, I can't even go. In. Oh, no. But many times, as Christians, we have to understand. Sometimes God wants us to do certain things which the world doesn't want us to do. It's very easy for us to neglect someone and go. But it's very important for us to hear from God and to say something. See, the river of God has to flow from you. And this living water was flow from Jesus to this woman. You know the story, I'm not going to read the story because what happened was, when this woman experienced this living water, it not only stopped with her, it went and touched the whole of Samaria. Everybody in Samaria came. That what we have to do, when we have received this living water, the Spirit of God, when we have received it, it shouldn't stagnate within us. It should flow from us and to someone. That's what Jesus is saying here. And that's why he was doing this before he was trying to say, what is this living water later in chapter 7. This happens in chapter 4 and the scholars say around 6 months later it happened in chapter 7. I'm not sure about it, but that's what the, um, uh, the Jewish canon and the scholars say when I was reading through so many articles and trying to understand how much time gap was there between this verse that Jesus was talking to Samaria and, and to uh, anyone when he was talking about to the people on the last, eight, last day of the feast, that is 8th day. Jesus very well know that what he's trying to do. Jesus very well know that he has to first do something to prove to the people that he is the living water. But the funny part is, not even disciples understood what Jesus was trying to say. Many times we get to the point where we don't understand what God wants us to do at that point of life. We take things for granted and say, it's okay to neglect this person, not to pray for this person, because we try to understand, oh, this person did something, this person spoke something bad about me, I know this person, I know she'll always, or he'll always do this. Problem is, when you get to the point of understanding the things in your mind, you are not able to operate the gifts of God so that the gift of God can flow from your life. Jesus forsake his thoughts, but in spiritual realms he knows that he needs to operate the living water so that he can touch the woman. So that day, if you think, Jesus gave an everlasting life to her. If you read a few verses down here, um, verse 13 on the same chapter, seven is, uh, uh, chapter 4, he says, Who were drinks of this water with thirst? Again, he, he talks about water in the well. And he says, but who were drinks? Of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing into everlasting life. So when we have thirst and when we have received this Jesus in us, the rivers of water will spring out of us and it has to give an everlasting life. Because Jesus had the character of everlasting life. When he goes and touches someone, a person who is dead, he has to come to life. A person who is sick, then he has to be healed. The living water was always flowing from Jesus. That's why when you see, even last week when um, a preacher was coming and ministering to us here, it's, it's, it could be easy. Someone comes and stands here and just say something and go off. But it makes a huge difference when the living water starts to flow from the person. 
When it starts to flow, it doesn't stop with him because he was keep saying, Oliver, uh, he was keep saying, he received it and he wanted to give it. Many times we have to give this living water to us and we have to understand this living water should automatically flow from us. I don't know why I'm insisting this today more because we've been singing so many songs about we are Christians touching him and changing earth, send revival, send fire, send so many things. But are we doing something especially when it comes to do something for God? Are we really, really, really doing? Or are we really, really, really have experienced this living water so that we can operate the living water through us? Many times we are so busy with things in this world and we never, never allow this water to flow from us. Many times it becomes quite easy for us to come and listen and then not to operate this living water. This living water has life. And I'm telling you, you could have gone dead in your sin. I could have gone dead in my sin just because I've received this living water in me. When I started to believe this everlasting life, the living water started to flow in me. And it has changed me. If it has changed you, and if you have received this everlasting life, you will have the thirst. Oh, I have to give this everlasting life to someone. Oh, this everlasting life of river has to flow through me. Your prayer life will change. Rather asking for blessings. Oh God, I'm standing. Oh, receive, 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 receive this blessing. You keep standing, you build a big, 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 big dam. But you don't give it. You don't give it. Of course, problems come. Of course, trial come. Of course, you go through a lot of ups and downs in life. But it doesn't make a difference to you if you don't allow the water to flow. All I'm trying to say to you is you have the living water inside you. And that's why you have come to this church. That's why you're staying in this church. That's why you're come, ev coming every week with thirst to know this God more and more. But allow this living water to flow. So that you will go and touch someone and give them life. Or you, sometimes you don't need to go. When someone comes to you, automatically. I've heard, I've heard or we have heard so many times Abraham come back and say from Russia. Sometimes he goes to someone who was just sitting there before someone in a bar or somewhere in the hotel. Suddenly the living water would have flown. Someone got, something, suddenly God speaks and touches and transforms. You know something? It happens because the water is flowing. The living water is flowing. The living water is flowing. I keep saying it's flowing because it's not stopped. It's not stopped. It's flowing. So one of the character which we should have and it should flow out of us is the everlasting life through the living water. This living water carries this character of everlasting life. So when you meet someone next time who doesn't know God, you should be able to give this everlasting life to them. This everlasting life should automatically go and touch them. That's why you touch heaven and change here. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. The second character which I, will try, I want to speak to you about is this river has the water of healing. Again, I come back to Ezekiel because um, I, I didn't read a few verses. It was um, taken over by the Spirit of God to say something. Um, so if you come back to Ezekiel chapter 47, let's read this few verses because I was so touched when I read these verses and I felt how beautifully before so many years Ezekiel would have seen this vision. I mean, I've written all these things so you and I could understand the Word of God, what Jesus was trying to fulfill. So, Ezekiel chapter 47, let me read verses from, sorry. So, Ezekiel chapter 47, verses from 6. He said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Wow, how would I have been right? He's seeing a great, great vision. Amen. Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of? The river. Can I hear? Are you reading the Bible? So what is written? The bank of? The river. The river. 
So Ezekiel is seeing a vision and his vision, the angel of the Lord is coming and he's taking him suddenly where? The bank of river. So what he's saying? When I return there along the bank of the river where, where many trees on the side and the other. So this is what he's seeing. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. healed. Amen. Amen. And it shall be that every living thing that moves are we moving these days? Amen. Are we moving? Hello? Yes. Amen. Amen. So we are living beings. Amen. God says about us. So the word is about us or to us. And it, it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes or go, will live. So first comes life. Amen. So when the living water comes in, we have life. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. For they will be healed. Who are they? It's us. Who are they? It's us. And not only us. Jesus says, out of him will flow the rivers of living water. This living water. So examine for a moment how this living water is doing in your life and from you to someone. It's very easy um, to just say because I know this living water and just go off or the other side of it is difficult for us to operate the living water through us so we can touch someone. And I'm here this evening time to call or give a call to everybody so that we can touch someone. I want a church, everybody in the church, out of you this living water should flow. I want everyone in the church to have this living water to flow. And unless this living water flows to you and through you, you cannot touch someone outside the church and someone will never come in. If you know, in this church, everybody who is sitting here, you are here because this living water has touched you by someone who is in the church. Amen. It's very important. It's very important. Turn to John chapter 9. Where you know about Jesus. He is the blind. As I said in the beginning, as a Jewish custom, custom for those um, seven days of Feast of Tabernacle, what they do? They take a huge jar and they go to the pool of Shalom and they draw a lot of water and come and pour the altar. So where they go? The pool of Shalom. Shalom. As I said, this water carries a huge amount of healing. That's why. Even before we get into this chapter 9 of John, if we read, go back to 2 Kings chapter 5, you see a huge, I just want to bring this before we go in. You see something special happening there. Everybody knows about the story, I believe, uh, King Naaman. Yes? So, what happens, um, this person is, this king is there, he's a good warrior, but what happens is, he has leper. Sad. So, one of the statements I love in this uh, uh, first few verses, I think verse 3, I believe, it says, Oh, we don't have a prophet so that someone could come and heal me. See the cry of someone. They were struggling for a prophet in a land to receive healing. How are we struggling these days, my church? We have plenty of prophets, we have plenty of apostles. Each of us has so much of a cube so that we can go and touch someone and heal. So, getting back to the story. So, you know it. So, the, uh, the young lady in, the, uh, uh, in his kingdom goes, says, You know, someone called a prophet Elisha. 
He's in Israel. So go and meet him. So this person, this king, um, said, I I'm not reading the verses, so I'm just trying, I want to just give the story so that you will enjoy the story rather than reading me the, uh, me reading the verses. So this king, Naaman, sends a letter to king of Israel. And this king of Israel, as soon as, see the faith of king Israel, king of Israel, as soon as he reads his letter, oh, why this person, Naaman, want to send a big curse upon me, a big war against me? Don't you know that I can't heal? So this king gets panic. So what happens? Uh, Elijah, Elisha comes to know and then he says, ask him to come and see me. But the beauty is, Naaman didn't come and see him when Elisha told him. Already Elisha sent a word to this person when he wants to come and see him and told him, go and go and dip inside Jordan for seven times. So this Naaman gets really, really angry. Did I come all the way traveling from my country to this country? I want to meet this person. Oh, someone called him called Prophet Elisha. This person is asking me to go and dip. Can't I dip somewhere? So the uh, servant of uh, the king Naaman says, didn't Elijah, Elisha ask you to do a simple thing? So at the end of the stories, he goes, how many times he dips? Seven times he dips. The eighth time, he didn't dare. After the seventh time, he's perfectly healed. Sometimes you need to understand the water has a healing anointing. And this water is the Holy Spirit. And that's why you come back to John chapter. I'm just giving you instances in the Bible so you understand and put your phrases wherever you are. I'm just trying to understand and articulate that how this water can bring healing. Yes, how this water carries the characteristics of healing. So that's why Jesus, when he sees this blind man, he takes saliva, he makes, sorry, he takes the mud, he puts his, his pad, the saliva, and he makes a good medicine. Some people say it's a very good medicine to heal. Even if you, I was searching on Yahoo uh, search and I, I came to know it's, it's literally even today uh, in Israel or some the old customs, they use this kind of saliva with mud for eye healing. If you have any infections in your eyes or your skins, and the very simple thing, okay? Uh, when I was very young, um, this is probably out of a message, but in, when I was very young, I used to get some little pimples, right? Every young, young, young kid has pimples. So um, uh, my mom used to say, just take your saliva and put it in the morning, early morning saliva, without brushing saliva, has a very good healing power. And, and that's very true. I'm not just joking because it's very true. If you want, you can go read a lot of articles. So probably Jesus would know all these things because he's the creator. And it's true. Saliva has carries a lot of healing anointing. Anyway, coming back to so Jesus, you know, the story comes here. Jesus prepares the mud with saliva, puts on his eye, and he asks him to go and dip in Shinnah. He could have just healed him there because the anointing is already flowing. But he wants to brew again, I'm telling you, the water carries a healing anointing. Sometimes it's difficult for us to understand that we already have the gift of healing in us. Many of us keep praying, oh, there are nine gifts of Holy Spirit. Lord, if I could have the gift of healing, I could go and heal. The beauty is, you already have the gifts of healing inside you. Because as soon as you start to believe, as soon as you started to receive the living water inside you, you already have the gifts of Holy Spirit. The characters, one of the important characters I'm telling you is, the water carries the healing. As we read in Ezekiel, the river flows and wherever it goes, it brings healing. Very important for us to understand. I hope I'm making you to understand the second character of the water or the living water is the river of healing, the water of healing. But why should Jesus stand on the last day to shout or cry with a loud voice to say all these things?
after seven days. The eighth day where God stands there. Number eight. Many times you have come to know about Abraham already would have told this. Number eight stands for a new beginning. It means a new beginning. Jesus wants to say to this people of Israel, Hey guys, I know you do this with so much of resemblance or so much of obedience. You priest carry a jar, you build a tent, you stay inside, you go and take water and then pour and do a lot of offering. And when they pour this water, they don't just pour just like that, oh, let me take and pour. No, there'll be big choir standing there, they'll be singing huge psalms and they'll be singing so much of songs and worship going around with so much of noises. Praising God for what he has done in the wilderness. 